Dr. Katie Bailey, and today we're going to do a brief review of the internal auditory canal. Our goal is to do a brief review of the anatomy and most frequent imaging pathology. The internal auditory canals contain the 7th and 8th cranial nerves, the facial nerve and the vestibulocochlear nerve, as well as the labyrinthian artery, which is a usually a branch from the AICA, the anterior inferior cerebellar artery, the vestibular ganglion, as well as having a dural lining and containing CSF around the nerves. The traditional IAC dedicated image is a thin cut axial T2, which is able to show nerve anatomy as well as flovoids. You can see the hyperintense T2 signal within the cochlea as well as the semicircular canals and the vestibule in between. We do pre and post contrast T1 weighted imaging as there should be no enhancement of the structures within the internal auditory canal. So the IAC should look the same pre contrast and post contrast. For the nerves in the internal auditory canal, the mnemonic that I learned was seven up, coke down. So this is the anterior aspect of the IAC on a sagittal view. You have the facial nerve superiorly and the cochleal nerve inferiorly. Posteriorly, so just look for the cerebellum to orient yourself, you have the superior and inferior vestibular nerves. This is something that likes to be tested on exam situations for radiology residents. A disease process you can get within the IAC is called a vascular loop syndrome. This can be microvascular compression of the nerves in the IAC that can result in tinnitus, vertigo, and hemifacial spasm if there is compression of the facial nerve. You can also get a vascular loop syndrome, which is related to a prominent loop of the AICA, possibly the labyrinthian artery, that enters the IAC and causes nerve compression. So what you're looking for, especially if you're looking for hemifacial spasm causes, is something compressing the seventh and eighth nerve complex along its course. Here, there is tortuous right and left vertebral artery flow voids displacing the seventh and eighth nerve complex posterolaterally. And here's a more superior one showing them that the vertebral arteries joining to form the basilar artery. So the normal seventh and eighth nerve complex to be extending laterally like the, it is here. This one is displaced and this person had right hemifacial spasm. What you can see in terms of IAC vascular loop is you're looking for a vessel touching the 7th and 8th nerve complex within the IAC. And when you see this vascular loop, you can describe is it touching it superiorly, medially, inferiorly, laterally? Is it touching it within the IAC? Is it touching it within the cisternal portion? You would describe all of these in terms of any vessel touching the nerves within the internal auditory canal. You can get a rare cause of compression. In this case, this was a vascular malformation around the brainstem. You see these abnormal flow voids in the prepontine cistern extending to those cerebellar pontine angles in the internal auditory canals. You can see enhancement of some of these vessels. So this was a vascular malformation causing a vascular loop syndrome involving the IACs. The most common tumor affecting the internal auditory canal is the vestibular schwannoma. These usually arrive from the inferior vestibular nerve and they can show cystic change or hemorrhage. So on the axial T2 thin cut weighted imaging of the IAC, you will see a mass obstructing the normal appearance of the hyperintense T2 signal CSF. You can see it's black on this image, whereas on the opposite side, you see a normal appearing 7th and 8th nerve complex. This one is projecting into the cerebellopontine angle. You're looking for pretty homogeneous enhancement, with the exception it can be heterogeneous if there is cystic change or if there is hemorrhage. It usually has an ice cream cone shape. There is widening of the porous acousticus, which is the opening of the internal auditory canal or internal auditory meatus. An enhancement can extend to any point within the IAC. It can fill the internal auditory canal and it can go in the cerebellopontine angle and even cause compression of the cerebellum or middle cerebellar peduncle depending on its size. This one involves the cerebellopontine angle but does not have mass effect on the adjacent structures and it involves a significant part of the intracanalicular portion or within the IAC. 
Here it is on the coronal view as well. They can also be very small, but still be very symptomatic. So here is a nodular enhancing focus within the distal left internal auditory canal, also a vestibular schwannoma. The second most common pathology at the cerebellopontian angle is the CP angle meningioma. This is a differential for an enhancing mass at the porous acousticus. What you will see is a mass that is centered not necessarily within the internal auditory canal, but adjacent to it. It is slightly hypo-intense on T2 weighted imaging, but not as dark as we saw on the previous vestibular schwannoma. You can also get homogeneous or slightly heterogeneous enhancement, but you'd like to see that dural tail sign or at least some degree of adjacent dural enhancement, whereas the vestibular schwannoma should be a self-contained mass. Here on the coronal view, you can see that dural tail extending inferior to the lesion. So look for that dural tail and look for center of the lesion outside the IAC along the dura. The third most common lesion at the cerebellopontine angle is the epidermoid. This can look cystic and subtle on T2, just look like more of a prominent extra axial CSF space with some mass effect, but can be more heterogeneous on flare. And on these thin cut T2 weighted images of the IAC, you can see there's more heterogeneous signal rather than homogeneous hyperintensity on T2. There can be some peripheral enhancement, but there is usually not much, if any, enhancement within the lesion. But the key is that DWI, there is restricted diffusion within an epidermoid. So an arachnoid cyst would be hyperintense on T2, but not show restricted diffusion. So this sequence is what differentiates that arachnoid cyst from an epidermoid. Bell palsy is another indication for IAC imaging. This is idiopathic peripheral facial paralysis. What you expect to see is uniform linear enhancement within the IAC, not nodular enhancement. So here's an example of a patient that presented with left side Bell's palsy. There is linear enhancement in the distal internal auditory canal extending towards that geniculate ganglion. Now the geniculate ganglion and the mastoid segments of the facial nerve do normally enhance. The IAC component should never enhance. So if you see enhancement within the IAC, always consider it abnormal. So here's a normal side, no enhancement. Here's that linear enhancement of the distal IAC going towards that geniculate ganglion. That is what you see for Bell palsy. And here is another case, but on the opposite side. So linear enhancement in that IAC, and you can see the enhancement extending to that nuclear ganglion, that nice triangle shape right here. So that is also a case of imaging findings positive in Bell palsy. Red flags in IAC images when you see nodular enhancement or you see multiple cranial nerves enhancing. So when you have those findings, in this case, you see nodular enhancement in that right internal auditory canal. But when you examine the other cranial nerves, you see nodular enhancement of that right trigeminal nerve and partial nodular enhancement of that left trigeminal nerve heading towards mechal cave. So your differential in this case would be lymphoma, sarcoidosis, metastatic disease, Lyme disease, or perineural spread of tumor. In this case, this was lymphoma. Thank you for your attention. Thanks to Dr. Bailey for this great video. Be sure to check out the other videos on the site. Check out LearnerRadiology.com and be sure to hit that subscribe and like button. Thanks.